In this segment, we're going to look at the reaction that involves adding halo acids to alkenes. So when we talk about a halo acid, what we're referring to is HCl, HBr, etc. So I'm abbreviating that as HX here in the title, and we'll continue doing that for some generic examples as we go along. So let's get started with looking at what happens when we mix a halo acid with an alkene. In the last segment, we mentioned that the general type of reactions that alkenes undergo are going to be that of addition reactions. So anytime you see an alkene molecule and some other reactant, what you should be on the lookout for immediately is the possibility of adding atoms across the carbon-carbon double bond. And that's exactly what we're going to do here in this type of reaction. So let's go ahead and get started with a specific example of an addition reaction where we're dealing with adding HCl, HBr, HF, or HI across the carbon-carbon double bond. So we're going to start here with 2,3-dimethyl-2-butene. And we'll go ahead and mix that in with HBr. And again, anytime you see an alkene as one of your reactants, be thinking addition. And we're going to walk through how we are going to go about adding HBr across the carbon-carbon double bond. So in other words, we're going to look at the mechanism for this particular reaction, that series of steps that's involved in going from the reactants to the product. So step by step here, looking at all the electron pushing going on, we're going to see that these reaction mechanisms are mechanisms that involve the formation of carbocations, much like in the last chapter, we talked about the SN1 reaction involving the formation of carbocation intermediates. Similarly here, we're going to be using carbocation intermediates, and we're going to look at similar factors stabilizing and destabilizing carbocations, meaning that tertiary carbocations are going to be the most stable type of carbocation that we can form. So let's take a look at the mechanism for this reaction. And one thing that I want to tell you here, as a general rule, not only for this type of reaction, but for a variety of other reactions as well, is if you see acid present in the reaction mixture, the very first step of the mechanism is more often than not going to be protonation, meaning that you are going to use that acid to protonate the base within the reaction. Remember, the base has to be something that has a lone pair of electrons or a pi bond. And that's exactly what we'll do here, is we will protonate first. So as a general rule, I'm going to go ahead and write this down because it's so important. So if you look at a reaction, be it an addition reaction such as this or any other type of reaction, when you see acid present in the reaction mixture, such as HBr, you're going to expect that the first step of the reaction mechanism is generally going to be protonation, an acid-base reaction where the acid is going to act as a proton donor, giving a proton up to the base. So how we'll work that out in this particular reaction mechanism is that, remember that the base has to be something that has pi electrons or lone pairs, and in the case of our alkene, we have a pi bond, and that pi bond is going to act as our base to grab a proton from our HBr, our acid. And this reaction step, acid-base reactions, are very, very quick. And so that's why this is going to be the very first thing that happens, or one of the reasons why this is the very first thing that happens in a lot of different mechanisms, is this protonation. So we come over, use the pi bond to attack the proton, grabbing that proton. That forces the HBr bond to break. And we could classify in this reaction step, the alkene is acting as our base, and of course our HBr is acting as the acid. Proton donor, proton acceptor. So let's go ahead and draw what would result from this mechanistic step. So the skeleton of our molecule, our organic compound, is the same as it was to start with, except that now we no longer have a pi bond in there. Instead, what's happened is those electrons from the pi bond, which I'll go ahead and highlight in blue there, have come over and formed a bond to the proton. So we'll go ahead and plug the proton onto one of the two carbons of the carbon-carbon double bond. It doesn't matter in this case which one you plug it onto because both of those two carbons are equally substituted. It's a totally symmetrical molecule. Both have a methyl group on them, in other words. And so we'll put the proton just on the carbon on the right. We could have put it on the carbon on the left instead. It's going to work out the same either way. And then as a result of that step of protonation, the other carbon, the one that didn't pick up the proton, is going to only have three bonds to it now, and so it's going to have to be a positively charged carbon. So we have a carbocation intermediate now. And in this case, the carbocation intermediate we've generated is a tertiary carbocation intermediate, so it's quite stable. The other intermediate that we will have generated as a result of this step is going to be the bromide anion. So our bromine initially had three sets of lone pair electrons, and then what happened during the course of the mechanism 
was that we broke that covalent bond between H and Br, sending the electrons using that blue electron pushing arrow onto the bromine. And so as a consequence of that electron pushing arrow there that I'm highlighting in red, we now would have an extra set of lone pair electrons on the bromine, thereby giving the bromine a negative one formal charge. So now at this point, since we did this step one, which we would describe as a protonation step, we've created intermediates of which one of those intermediates is a good nucleophile. The other one is an excellent electrophile. And so we go back to those terms that we learned in the nucleophilic substitution chapter, and hopefully you identify that the bromide anion would be an excellent nucleophile. It has an excess of electron density. It has that negative formal charge, making it highly qualified to act as a nucleophile. On the other hand, we learned in the last chapter with our nucleophilic substitution reactions that carbocations make excellent electrophiles. They're very hungry for more electron density since they have that positive formal charged atom. So now what we'll do here at step two is since we have, as a result of step one, generated a nucleophile and electrophile, and step two, we're just gonna plug those two together. So step two, we'll describe as the nucleophile attacking the electrophile. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm just redrawing the intermediate that we generated there as a result of step one, making sure to plug in my formal charge there on the carbon. I'm not gonna show that blue hydrogen atom explicitly since it's implied that it has to be there on that carbon since we have no formal charge listed. And then I'm gonna go ahead and plug in the bromide anion as well. So our bromide comes in and the bromide is gonna use its lone pair of electrons to attack that carbocation. And just like we've seen before, the nucleophile is gonna be the source of the electrons. So that's where the arrow starts. And then the arrow needs to be very targeted to show where the electrons are finishing at. They are finishing at the carbocation. So we'll show the arrow head ending up there. So let's go ahead and finish this up. So go ahead and draw the carbon skeleton the same as it was to start with. And then we're gonna go ahead and draw in the new bond to bromine in blue and plug in our bromine. And that bromine still has three sets of lone pair electrons that haven't gone anywhere or done anything. So those are gonna be our three lone pair sets that are still there in the end. And the one set of lone pairs that was used to attack the carbocation, I'm showing as blue there. Now at this point, our product that we've drawn has no formal charges on any atoms, and we would expect this to be a relatively stable final product. And this in fact is our final addition product. So what you'll see has happened here in the final net situation is that We've taken our carbon skeleton that we started with, which originally had that carbon-carbon double bond in there. We got rid of the carbon-carbon double bond and we replaced it with a bromine on one of the two carbons and a hydrogen on the other, thereby qualifying this as an addition reaction. We've added groups across the carbon-carbon double bond. So let's go ahead and ramp up the intensity of this just a little bit more. And we're gonna look at a situation where the starting alkene is not an alkene that has equally substituted carbon atoms. In other words, where I've drawn the blue dots there in the upper left corner, both of those carbons have the same number of alkyl groups on them. We're gonna look at an asymmetrical alkene instead, an alkene where we have an unequal number of alkyl groups bonded to each of those two carbons. So let's take a look at that now. In this example, what I've done is drawn a starting alkene that does not have equally substituted alkene carbon. So the alkene carbon on the left has two alkyl groups bonded to it. The alkene carbon on the right that I just drew a red dot on has only one alkyl group bonded to it and it would have a hydrogen there to fill its complete octet. So in this case, we would end up with two different constitutional isomers depending upon where we chose to put the H and the Cl. In other words, if we put the H right here and the Cl right here, we're going to end up with a different constitutional isomer than if we instead chose to put the Cl here on the left and the H on the right. So we need to know which of these products is going to be preferred or is there going to be equal preference for both of those? So to answer that question, we can look at the mechanism for this reaction. So we're going to dive through the mechanism much like we did for the last example, only this time we're going to have to pay special attention to predicting what intermediates would be favorable at each step. The first step of this mechanism, just like before, is protonation. 
So in this protonation step, we'll take a look at our alkene starting material. Just redrawing what we had there in the net equation. Bring in your HCl, our halo acid, and do the protonation. So this step, so far, looking very analogous to what we did in the first example, where the pi bond comes over, and it's going to grab that proton, forcing the bond between H and Cl to break, leaving us with chloride anion, like so, as well as our protonated intermediate. So we have two possibilities here for the protonated intermediate, depending on which of the two carbon atoms of the alkene picks up the proton. So those two possibilities are that if the proton that was just picked up goes to the carbon on the left, that's going to place the carbocation on the carbon on the right. The other possibility is that we could instead have that carbon on the right pick up the proton. And so if we did that, we would end up with this being a CH2 group because again, it had one hydrogen here to start with on the left side. It picked up one, so it becomes a CH2. And then that would place our carbocation right here at that carbon. So we have to ask ourselves, which of these two intermediates would be more stable? Because the one that is more stable is going to be the more favorable one in this acid-base reaction. So which of these two intermediates would we expect to be more stable? In order to answer that question, we have to think back to what we know about the stability of carbocations. And in the case of the situation on top, this would represent a secondary carbocation because it has two alkyl groups directly bonded to that carbon. On the other hand, we come down to the one below. This represents a tertiary carbocation because it has three alkyl groups, one, two, three directly bonded to it. Thinking back about the rules for carbocation stability, we recognize that a tertiary carbocation is more stable than a secondary or more stable than a primary, all things else being relatively equal. So in this case, the more stable intermediate is going to be the one that is down below here. So this intermediate, the tertiary carbocation, is the one that we want to go with as our major intermediate. So I'm just going to put an X through this one up top because generally we're looking for the major organic product, which is going to correspond to the major pathway through this reaction. So we made our preferred tertiary carbocation. The reason we did that is because a tertiary carbocation is more stable than a secondary and more stable than a primary. The term that we use to describe this selectivity for making the tertiary carbocation instead of the secondary carbocation in these addition reactions is referred to as following Markovnikov's rule. Markovnikov was a scientist who did a bunch of empirical experiments using alkenes and adding a variety of different halo acids to them, finding that the proton always preferred to add to the carbon that had more hydrogens bonded to it to start with. And the basis for why Markovnikov's rule works. In other words, why do you add the hydrogen to the carbon that already has more hydrogens is because this is what's going to yield the most stable carbocation. So Markovnikov's rule is pretty much a, a rule of carbocation stability. It's saying make the most stable carbocation and you can do that by adding the H to the carbon that has more hydrogens and fewer alkyl groups bonded to it to start with. So be on the lookout here to make the most stable carbocation you can as a result of this first step of the mechanism, the protonation step. Then from there, we're gonna go onward to the second step of the reaction mechanism and toward our final product here. So we'll go ahead and move this downward a little bit. And now that we've moved this downward a little bit, we take a look at the second step, which is going to, just as in our first example, be that step where the nucleophile attacks the electrophile. Just like before, our nucleophile is going to be our anion. The electrophile is our carbocation. So let's take our major electrophile that we generated as a result of that first step. So our major electrophile we generated was that tertiary carbocation. And the nucleophile that we generated as a result of that first step was the chloride anion. So the chloride anion is going to come over. It is going to attack the carbocation, it uses its electrons to do so, so our arrow starts at the electrons, ends on the atom, as it always does when we're doing mechanisms, and we will go ahead and draw out the final major product. So our chloride comes in and attacks like so. This gives us our final inner 
final product that has no formal charges on any of the atoms. So Markovnikov's rule that we've illustrated in this example, we can think of as a rule of regioselectivity. Remember that regioselectivity indicates there's a preference for a specific constitutional isomer over others that are theoretically possible. And Markovnikov's rule is going to define the regioselectivity for this particular reaction. Because in this particular reaction, the final product that is preferred in this reaction corresponds to placing the chlorine here at the carbon on the left, the more substituted carbon, and the new hydrogen on the carbon on the right, the less substituted hydrogen, rather than flipping those and putting the hydrogen on the left and the chlorine on the right. And so since there's two possible constitutional isomers that this reaction could theoretically yield, but in actuality has a preference for one constitutional isomer over the other, we would describe this particular situation as being regioselective. So I'm going to go ahead and label this reaction as being regioselective. For it to be regioselective, we have to start with an alkene that is unequally substituted at the two carbons of the alkene so that there can be that preference for adding chlorine to one of the carbons and hydrogen to the other, preference for how those two add, one adding to the more substituted carbon, one adding to the less substituted carbon. That's going to allow this reaction to become regioselective. It's going to allow it to have a preference for what constitutional isomer forms out of this. We could also ask about whether this reaction is going to be stereoselective or not. In this particular reaction, we aren't creating any chiral centers during the reaction because you'll notice that the two sites that have reacted here and here in those green dots are not chiral centers. So this reaction inevitably is going to be non-stereoselective. So reaction is not stereoselective. So that's our look at an introduction to adding halo acids to alkenes. We're going to follow this up in the next segment with looking at situations where the carbocation is able to rearrange. So in other words, can we do a hydride shift or a methyl shift to convert a secondary carbocation into a tertiary carbocation? That's what we'll look at in the next segment.